My conversation today is with Derek Jackson. Based in North Carolina, he and his wife, Paige, are the owners of Grass Graze, where they raise grass-fed and pastured chicken, pork, and beef using regenerative and rotational practices. Prior to Grass Graze, Derek had a 13-year career in the U.S. military before transitioning to farm life. We dive into so much during our conversation here, including the intersection of farm and family life, the different breeds of livestock Derek is raising, and a new educational platform that he and Paige are developing to help other farmers succeed. This is the Regenerative Agriculture Club podcast, and here is my conversation with Derek Jackson. All right. Thanks for joining us here, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I am sharing the mic here with Derek Jackson with Grass Grays. Derek, hey, man, thanks for being here and I appreciate the time. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me, Dan. Uh, I've been looking forward to the conversation. Likewise. Well, we're certainly going to be covering a ton of detail about what you and your wife, Paige, have built with Grass Grays and the impactful work that you all are doing there. But I know you have a unique story because you were also doing highly impactful work prior to uh, raising livestock. So I wonder, can you share with folks just about your 13-year uh, career in the, the, the U.S. Army and just kind of like as you were coming to the end of your military career and transitioning into civilian life, like what was that, uh, what was that mindset process like? Yeah. Um, yeah. So as you mentioned, um, I spent 13 years Army Special Operations um, and my last station was in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So, which is currently, uh, we're still in North Carolina. That's what, that's what keeps us here. Um, but yeah, so um, I spent the last 13 years traveling the world um, from everything from Afghanistan, Iraq to um, um, uh, Bogota, uh, Colombia, uh, which is where I spent the last four years of my career. Um, before um, kind of what I did in the military, which actually prepared me for what I would be doing now, which I did not know at the time, was um, Army Civil Affairs. Uh, Civil Affairs uh, specializes with uh, the human domain. Um, so uh, specifically, I worked with the Department of Agriculture in, uh, in South America. So uh, I learned Spanish, uh, was not, I'm a first generation farmer, uh, which means no prior history whatsoever. Um, my family had land in the uh, Delta of Mississippi, but if you know anything about it, it's mostly soybeans and corn. Um, and I only saw it maybe one once. And the first time I ever saw something being harvested was like two, maybe like two weeks ago, and we were harvesting our own uh, our our own hay. So I had never seen any type of uh, agriculture in production uh, before in my life. Um, so. The military kind of pushed me out there. I was doing crop substitution. Um, I was a project manager with the USD, US, uh, USAID, uh, specializing in crop substitution in South America. So trying to get uh, farm uh, landowners to grow different substances uh, away from other things. So trying to get them to specialize in um, chocolate or um, beans. And of course, like those things that uh, we need across the world. Um, Th throughout the uh, transition, I started experiencing some uh, medical issues. Um, started having a lot of congestion, a lot of stomach issues, and which is it, which didn't make sense because uh, special operations uh, they 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 put a lot of money into um, into their equipment and into their 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 personnel. So there was no reason why I had a personal trainer, a nutritionist, and I'm working out six times a week and you know eating supposedly the right things. Uh, I didn't know at the time it was not the right things. Uh, it just, it didn't add up. So I'm cycling, I'm riding like uh, 26 miles on Saturday with a few friends from work. And like, so there was no reason why physically I felt, you know, sluggish and this congestion. And then my wife uh, started doing a little bit of research and comes to find out it was uh, the dairy that we were consuming. Uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that, that, that kind of, that kind of led us into that transition. I knew that I was trying to, um, I wanted to make a transition from traveling. Um, I spent about 275 days out of the year in South America, uh, or, you know, just traveling in general for my job. And I have five kids, uh, five from the ages of one and a half to, to 10. So, you know, my wife had a, had a, had, was running a marketing, uh, had a little marketing uh, firm thing set up that she was doing. And it just, 
it started getting crazy and I was ready to slow down. So throughout that transition, I was like, well, what am I going to do? Um, and after spending that time in South America doing those things, I was like, man, well, maybe, wait, you know, the food that I'm eating is contributing to, you know, kind of my medical issues. So maybe, you know, what does it look like for me to do it on my own? Like, what can we do? I live in a uh, uh, suburb in, in a metropolitan area. There's not much I can do. I started composting uh, just to, you know, try to, you know, do my part. Uh, and then I started shopping at farmer's markets. And then long story short, the uh, farmer ran out of chicken. That was the only thing we could find. There was pasture raised. There was non-GMO. Um, there was no grass-fed beef or anything. We couldn't find anything that we could source where we could go out and see that it was uh, being, you know, it was being harvested or um, raised in a way that we felt was uh, the right way. And chicken was the only thing. Chicken producer ran out. He The chicken farmer ran out of chicken. And Paige and I were just like, well, what do we do? You know, we went to went to a couple of grocery stores and it's just the, the price of pasture raised organic, you know, chicken. If you can find pasture raised in the store, uh, you can find organic, but I'm not even sure you can find pasture raised in the stores still to today. Um, it was you couldn't find it and it was extremely expensive and we could not source it. Like we would look at the name and be like, well, that that doesn't make sense because how are they raising and then you go on Google Maps and you see that it's because they have these these large uh, buildings that look like uh, storage facilities. Um, yeah, and that's, that's what they raise their organic chicken in. And so, no, we started, uh, we purchased some chickens and we started raising them in our backyard, in our subdivision. You know, I didn't ask any questions. I just was like, man, like we got to eat. So we're going to do it. Uh, re- you know, I had been reading, doing a lot of reading. Uh, throughout this time, like just developing an understanding of where our food comes from and trying to like build a connection. And I didn't build that connection until we bought those chickens. I didn't establish that connection until we got those baby chickens. And once we got them, it was like, oh, okay. You know, now I understand like I'm, you know, getting up early in the morning to move the chickens or um, I'm building different I built some chicken tractors uh, in our yard and I'm sure our neighbors were like, what? Like, this is a fancy neighborhood. Like, I mean, this was, this is where in our city, it's like that neighborhood that people are always waiting for a home to come for sale, but it never does. So, uh, and we, we got into the neighborhood and, uh, and, you know, and then I put a chicken tractor out on the yard and you know, people are like, I think it's a greenhouse. It's yeah. like, no, yeah, it's much. definitely the chickens inside of there. Yeah. And sure enough, that's um, and then that was history. We we just started we should and, and that all like from that point, I was like, I want to raise chicken, you know, for our family. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do after I get out of military. I looked into some other things like uh, consulting, but then the consulting thing just kind of pulled me away from the house as well. And farming was the thing. It was like, well, wait a minute. My friends and neighbor are like, well, can you can we buy some of your chicken? I was like, we only have twenty five. Like. <laughs> But sure, I'll take them. And uh, we give some to some friends and family. And then they're just like, this is amazing. Like mm-hmm. a few friends from our CrossFit gym were like, I cannot find this. I, I will I will buy whatever you raise. Like I'll buy them all. And I was like, well, we got to eat through the winter. So you can't buy them all. But and I started looking at the numbers and my wife was like, uh, there's something to this. And yeah. of course, I started crunching the numbers and the numbers made sense. Uh, Joe Salt's numbers made sense. Jordan Green's numbers made sense. And I was like, wait a second, this is it. You know, I, I my background is in business. So it was like, well, I, this makes sense. I'm going to do this. Like we're, we're doing it. And we started, we started farming from that point. That's so great. Uh, so then how long after you kind of had that, um, that market validation that, that you and Paige uncovered that you, then you, uh, relocated to the, the the property you're on now. Yeah, so market validation happened in Oct- uh, November uh, 2019, mm-hmm. and we signed a lease on a property on December 1st. Yeah, it was at the uh, at the Thanksgiving uh, Thanksgiving table. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was like, wait a second, this is our food. Like we we raised this chicken. We we ate chicken. Uh, we raised this chicken. And we're going to do it. The next month, a friend called and asked if I was interested in raising some pigs. I was like, I don't have land. <laughs> and he was like, well, 
you know, it's a, I want to raise pigs. And I mean, he's a special operations as well. It's like, well, I want to raise pigs. So you should raise, raise pigs. And I got the pigs and then I found the land next. So we signed the lease in, D- in December. So two months later. That's great. Can you uh, d- uh, describe the just the, the community in the, in the region of North Carolina that you all are based? Yeah. So we are in, um, we're in East. Uh, it's called the Piedmont, um, a Raleigh-Durham Triangle. And it's made up of three metropolitan areas. So it's actually a really great location. Uh, we're about an hour, um, we're about an hour east or west of the, um, of the coast. And then uh, we're an hour and a half of the, about an hour and a half, uh, two hours from the uh, Rockies. Um, so, and, and so mostly metropolitan area. Uh, we're surrounded by um, a couple of different, so Raleigh-Durham is, is the new, I guess, the, the new kind of tech, tech bubble. Mm-hmm. And, um, and North Carolina, where Raleigh has grown extremely fast uh we came at a great time because we're we're, we're going to be able to grow with the city um so we have a lot of people transitioning they were already transitioning with apple and then with amazon um prior to covid but now after covid uh we've seen a lot of uh, uh new people from california and uh new york new york can you tell folks about just some of the characteristics of of the farm that uh, you are based and and also to some of the the breeds that you're raising now too so the breeds are we're, so I'll list what we raise. We're doing grass fed, uh, grass fed and finished uh, beef or cattle, um, grass fed or grass pasture raised. Everything is pasture raised, pasture raised uh, chicken, pasture raised um, um, pork and then uh, free range uh, eggs um, of those animals. We are currently raising Dexter cattle. Jersey and Milk and Devons, which are which is our um, which is our grass fed dairy. Uh, we do a little bit of grass fed dairy. Um, we raise Heritage um, Freedom Rangers as our um, as our as our egg layers, and then we do Cornish Cross for our pasture bird. It's like our uh, commercial bird, um, and we mix it a little bit with with um, Freedom Rangers as well. Um, and then our hogs, we do three different breeds. Uh, this is probably the center. They're not. They're not the centerpiece. Dairy is the centerpiece of our operation. But this, like, it's the heart, I guess, of uh, of me is the um, is the pork and raise a heritage um, red wattle and a Tamworth uh, Tamworth what is that Tamworth Duroc cross and um, these are just it's a so the red wattle is the known as the other red meat. Um, it's pure, like, it's just, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, they, they produce a beautiful mar- marble and it looks, if you compare it, it almost looked like a, you wouldn't know that. Well, I would know the difference, but most people wouldn't know the difference. If I showed them a picture, they were like, I think that's a steak. Like, sure. It's a steak, but is it pork or chick? I mean, is it pork or beef? And they're like, it's beef. Of course. No, that's actually, that's actually pork. Uh, and, uh, and then our commercial uh, pork, which is like our just standard, is our Tamworth, uh, our Tamworth Bershaw cross. Yeah. I and then the makeup of the land. I'm sorry, I forgot the. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So, which is the interesting part of this whole thing is because all these animals are raised in the same location and we currently are um, managing that now. Um, we are currently managing a total of 160 acres, soon to be. Um, 200 acres, um, in the next few weeks. Um, and this is old tobacco land, um, old tobacco land originally that that's the, that's this, uh, North Carolina, the area that we're located in is known for tobacco. So, um, you, it's not uncommon to drive down a street, you know, drive down. The only thing you see is tobacco steel today. Um, so this, our land was a prior tobacco firm about 20 years ago. And since then it was just you know, just left land. And, um, and so we've just been, we found a landowner that was, that was, that bought the land to keep it from going back to development or going back to any type of, um, commercial farming. And, um, and, you know, he was just like, I don't really need the land, but I don't want to, I want to see it farmed. And we were like, okay, perfect. Cause that's exactly what we need. So of those 160 acres, 
about a hundred of those, 125 is um, is woodland, and the uh, remaining is a cleared pasture, which is you know kind of what our you know we're just. I would say that I used to say that our cattle was always on pasture, but that's not the case. So we let them, we're now sending them through um, pasture. I mean, through woodland areas that we have cleared with our hogs. So everybody is sharing the same land right now. So I'm definitely very much an amateur when it comes to just, you know, understanding the, just the, the systems and, and operations of rotational grazing. And for somebody like myself, when you're talking to like a prospective customer or people within your community, um, I, I would assume that they would immediately think like, oh my gosh, like that, that there's a lot happening on in, in, in what would be conventionally considered a small footprint of land. So for the, 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 the newbies out there in the audience, uh, what would be just like a high level one-on-one overview of, of rotational grazing and how you're managing the land? Yeah. So, um, rotational grazing, uh, rotational grazing, the importance of it, um, it sounds, it always sounds good in theory, but um, understanding why will keep you um, disciplined to actually, you know, doing it. Um, the why is it allows us to allow the uh, land to rest between, you know, different animal groups. Uh, we we cause disturbance, uh, which it's which is a good thing in in, in agriculture. Uh, we cause a minimal amount of uh, disturbance, with it, which allows which allows the uh, soil um, to, you know, do a bunch of it's not even say, my mom would say marinate. Um, it, it allows the soil to marinate, you know, what the animals have left behind the good stuff, um, because we our animals lay good stuff. Um, and, um, and so it allows the land to marinate and then um, the rotation of grazing. So, yes, it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, our cattle is moved every single day. Um, and so our so we have two different sets. So our our grant, our dairy, our Jersey cows are moved almost once or like almost twice a day. And we have to do that because they eat all day. They just, they'll eat nonstop. All cows don't do that. I, I thought that they did, but they really don't. They'll eat. And once they're full, they'll sit, you know, they'll lay down. The jerseys, they just, they just eat all day long. So, um, so we kind of, there's like a dance. And uh, so the cattle are moved and then we run our broilers behind the cattle. So our brothers are, are, are uh, meat birds and, tra- and tractors, and they are normally about three or four days is what we like to shoot for. But sometimes it's like a week behind the behind the cows just because the cows move so fast and the, the tractors only, you know, take up as much space. Um, but our layers, because they're free range, they they kind of they kind of help us with the. Um, with the lack of um we don't so you want to have an even balance of each animal group which allows you to evenly distribute manure and then evenly um distribute you know the amount of carbon and um and then if you have enough you want to have enough layers and chickens in order to clean up after the cows that's the that's kind of like the the craziness to the whole thing the dance um so we have enough cattle currently to where well we have enough birds or chickens or free range um, birds to clean up because the, the chickens do all the cleaning up um, and they clean up after the cows. That keeps us from having a bunch of flies um, and it keeps, you know, it keeps, it, it turns the manure into fertilizer. So without the chickens, it takes the the uh, manure a little bit more. It takes it a lot longer to break down and you kind of lose that. When the chickens come through, they'll scratch through and kick it all around they move on. And then when our broilers come through, they'll do the same thing, but the broilers are a little bit lazier. So they kind of, you know, they do a, they're a little bit lazier, but, but they, they'll, they'll get the work done. They're just slow. So, um, and then our pigs, so the pigs are just, they're just in there and they're just, they're kind of the, because we only do pigs, chicken and uh, cows. Um, our pigs are, we kind of use them as a, as a, um, as a, as, as the lead. And they're the ones who clear the path for us. We don't we don't do any tilling or anything like that. We don't have a we don't have a bunch of bush hogs or uh, when it comes to like clearing some of our pasture land or just maintaining some of our woodland areas. Our pigs do that. So we send the pigs in, and the pigs move every seven days. And uh, and it's the same thing with the cows. The only difference with the pigs are the pigs don't their manure isn't isn't as big as the cows, and it's not as you know 
um, it's a lot condensed. It's a lot more condensed. So we can leave them. It takes them a little bit longer to actually disturb the land. So we move them every seven to 10 days. And then we normally don't run anything behind our pigs. We let the free range chickens go and figure out where, you know, what needs to happen. And and the areas where uh, we need for the pigs to be cleaned up after, which is same as the cows, um, the chickens will go and they'll scratch you and they eat all they eat out the bad stuff. Um, and the bad stuff is just corn uh, that doesn't get corn or whatever is like in the diet of the animal uh, that doesn't get processed, which is what the flies come and eat. So it's important to have the rotational grazing helps you ma- maintain. Um, it helps you manage your land as well as maintain um healthy animals, because when we're moving them, um, it allows, it actually disturbs the whole, um, the host and parasite thing. So when there is no host and the parasite has nothing to eat off of, and if the, if the pigs, if the cows are gone after the next day, then you don't, there ain't no parasite. Like the, the parasite can't keep up with the cows, with the pigs the same way. The pigs are only there for seven days. So, I mean, depending on how condensed the area is, would depend on how fast the parasites will kick up um, because we move them way before they will have enough time for there to be a host. Um, we prevent our, so we don't have, so long story short, we don't have any sick animals. Sounds like the perfect ecology. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, of, of everything that you raised, do you, I mean, do you have a personal favorite cut of meat? Um, yes, I actually, hmm. Yeah, I do. It's actually uh, pork, and it is the um, it's it's some people know it as the uh, collar. This is the collar steak. It's the it's behind the head of the it's behind the head of the uh, pig. Okay. It's uh, it's the um, some people refer to it as a, a different name, but um, it's not the tenderloin. Um, it's like a it, it's made up of like a muscle, and it is the the best cut, and it's kind of like. Um, I don't want to get this wrong. Um, on a on a cow, the you know people like you know fillet and um, you know New York strip or something. But that the the picanha picanha is is a part is the it's the same thing on a cow. It is the best cut of a cow. If you go to a Brazilian steakhouse, that that cut of meat, they only bring it out like if you have you ever been to a Brazilian steakhouse. I have. Okay, so this cut of meat, they they normally only bring it like maybe once or twice. Everything else, they're gonna bring it like, oh, you want more? You're like, no, no, no. Where's that other, the little thing? And it's yeah, they don't bring it very often. But a friend of mine who's Venezuelan was the one who put me on it. Now that I'm farming, everybody asks for it. So and I'm like, well, it's only a, we only have a few of those. So uh, so yeah, um, yep, the collared on the uh, the collar steak on a uh, on a on a heritage raised uh, pig. And how would you best prepare that? Yep. Yeah, so um, honestly, salt, pepper on the grill over a hot flame. Uh, it literally takes about maybe 10, maybe 10, 15 minutes, you know, over just as hot as you can get it. Uh, you know, five, maybe, maybe four or five minutes on each side, a little salt and pepper. And that is all you need because the 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 flavor, the flavor comes from the, the fat. So it's surrounded in fat. And so all of that, that fat, that um, all of that good stuff, fat is what seasoning it seasons the meat. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's it is the best. I mean, and you can, I mean, you can prepare it a bunch of different ways, but I, I like to cook it like a steak. You know, slice it um, and eat it uh, with salt and pepper. That that's it. Like it, it naturally it, that that fat it, it changes it. Love it. I'm on it. I'm gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta go to a butcher though and ask them. You gotta tell them, hey, I wanna a collar steak and they're going to be like, what? you like, yeah, the, the collar steak. And they're going to be like, Oh, okay. You want that? There we you go. Know, that's the butcher's, that's the butcher's cut. I it's, see. The yeah. <laughs> it's the one that they don't sell. Yeah. It's the one that they don't sell. Good to know. All right. Well, Derek, you're not only just raising livestock, you're also raising a young family. So I'm curious to learn more about, you know, how's that balancing act work? Oh yeah. It's uh, it's, I thought rotational grazing was a dance. <laughs> no. So, uh, yeah, five kids, uh, two boys older, and then our three, we have three young uh, girls. And they're all homeschooled currently. And this, it's been a transition in itself. So transitioning from a 14, 13, 14 year uh, career into starting a business in agriculture and then uh, starting a homeschool um, is 
you know, it's, it's been, it's been tough. And, um, but like, it's, it's really similar to farming because they're like, there are days where, um, where we're just like, you know, we're, we're in step and we're moving and everything is just doing its thing. And, you know, we're just, the rhythm is going. And then, you know, it, maybe someone, I don't know, the, we'll have a sow that'll go into labor. For example, no, I'll use last night. Um, last night I had to pick up from one of our producers and I didn't get home until the boys went with me. We all went, me and the boys, we took the trip. We went in, picked up, and we came back. Um, the day started at five o'clock. I got up and did all the chores. We jumped in the cars and we drove down and picked up. And as we're coming back, um, you know, still homeschooling in the car, um, you know, and it's it's fine. And then we get home and and of course, the trip took four hours longer than we expected. And the boys are eating at eight. The girls are already asleep. Um, you know, Paige and I haven't had a chance to talk. And then there's still the business part of it, you know, that we have to discuss orders, uh, re negative review uh, that's like poking me in the side. And uh, and then it's like, OK, well, we you know, we still have to talk. OK, school wise, what what are we doing? And, the, you know, what what happened today? What did you learn? Um, so it's um, it's. And we still have to milk cows and then do all that other stuff before going to bed. So it was like one o'clock. And then this morning we get up and it's the same thing again, only, you know, kids still got to go to school. And we still so it's been but so it's been it's been it's been difficult, but it's been, I would say, challenging. And I say challenging because I'll say challenging. I'll say my last job was difficult. What I was doing before was difficult. Going 265 days a year, uh, 275 ish, um, kids in private school, um, the swim, competitive uh, dan or comp competitive swim, dance, soccer, all this. I mean, it would that was that was difficult. This is challenging, and I say challenging because I like a challenge. I welcome challenges because it's fun. Like throughout the process, we're just like we're discovering new things. Um, our oldest is you know at the point where he's just. Uh, He's growing up to the point where he's he wants to be more independent. He wants to do things on his own. He's taking more of a, you know, big brother stance. And and that means more for me because it's like, OK, well, now I have to make I have to make, you know, I have to pay special attention to you because you're you know, you're developing into a young man. So um, and it's just and it's not the same. You know, none of them are the same anyway. Paige and I do these things where. My wife, this page keeps keeps she does a job in she does a very good job at managing this. Um, you're gonna take, you know, you're gonna take the kids out one, you know, we're gonna take them out individually, meaning me and you with one of them, they're gonna get a date, and then you with them, and then me with them. So it's like everybody gets individual attention from both of us and then us together. Um, which at first I was like, I don't know, I don't have time for this. Like this is, but um, but we, you know, now that we're doing, now that we're farming, like it, it has given us, um, now we're business owners. Um, it has given us the freedom to say, um, I'm going to take my sons with me. And then throughout this process, you know, they can learn about these different things. Like they can ask the questions that I would have never had time to, or they would have never even thought of if we weren't driving through the mountains of uh, North Carolina or Virginia. So, um, I mean, it's it's been it's been it's been challenging, but it has it is it's been great. Um, it has been the one thing that I have. Um, I mean, it doesn't get old. It really does not get old. Um, sometimes things in, in in farming, you're just like, OK, I'm over this. Yeah. I'm going to keep doing it. But I'm I'm, I'm over this. This is going to be the, the, the number two hire. Yep. this we're going to hire for this. But with raising a family, it's just been, you know, we're just kind of it, it. It doesn't get old because there's always something, something new. And I mean, we're deodorant is the new thing. And you, you thought that it was old, but hey, it's time to buy deodorant for my 11 year old. So um, that was what I woke up to this morning. So and it wasn't, hey, dad, I need this. It was, um, what's that like? 
nobody should smell. I'm the only person that smell like that, you know, and not in the morning. Like, um, and sure enough, my wife was like, I told you, um, you know, this was coming. So, yeah. <laughs> love it. It's love been it. great. Yeah. Love it. Well, what, one of the things I love about this just area of regenerative agriculture and and just the mission towards a more just and relocalized food system is that it, it, it's opening up a, a new uh, demographic of, of farmers. It's making, you know, the average farmer younger. It's, it's making the industry more diverse and inclusive. And I wondered, I thought that'd be a good time to transition to the work that you're doing with the Farmers Concord. Can you tell us a little bit more about that work? Yeah. So the Farmers Concord is, um, is ex- so one of the things that um, we have we identified first, I mean, just before we even started doing this was I hesitated with, you know, taking the plunge into starting a farm. Um, and it was for a number of reasons. And believe it or not, financing was not was not even we didn't have a whole lot of money. I mean, I was I mean, it was in a, we were in the military and, uh, you know, just that's that's all we did. Uh, we were. We were just we were getting by um, and starting a business. A lot of the times, you know, you look at like, well, how am I going to fund this? And that wasn't a thing. I had an issue with wrapping my mind around if. What, you know, if I could be if I could bring some relevant um, something relevant to the field um, and and that's that's always that's I mean, that's just been a part of like everything that I've done, any type of job or thing that I've been a part of. It's always like, OK. What can I bring to this? Um, what am I going to contribute? And it was just like, man, I don't, I don't know because when I told people that I was interested in starting a farm, a livestock farm, it was just like, mm. but first of all, you're in the military and you're not a far- like you've never done it before. It's the first thing, and then, um, and then the friends or family that um, that that are just you know they're. <laughs> They're a lot more blind. It was just like, how many, you don't know any, how many black farmers do you know? Like, I was like, well, I, I don't, like, I don't, honestly, I don't, I know some, but not, I don't know any livestock. And that was the thing. I was like, I don't know any lives black, you know, African-American livestock farmers or just minority. I didn't know any. Um, and that was like, okay. Not really an issue, for, an issue for me. It was just like, well, this is going to be interesting because, but th- but that's also it identified a need, um, and a need for education, and not just for minorities, but just you know education and knowledge for not just consumers and eaters, but the next generation of farmers in the military. Like you, you learn that it's it's never about you. And at the point that I was at, I spent a lot more time training and teaching and coaching and mentoring others. Um, you know, to do the things that I was doing or to uh, push them to do, you know, things that they were good at um, or that they were passionate about. And so with farming, it was like, man, I'm, I love like after I established, you know, this love um, for the the field, it was just like, well. There's a, the issue isn't, you know, funding like the issue is one education and then just um just access to regenerative farming because for, I mean, minorities using farming are like, you know, I mean, maybe 1%, I think it's 1%. And, um, and then of those farms, how many of them are regenerative farms? It's like, Ooh, and we don't like maybe one, maybe one, I'm going to say 1% cause I don't think it's that many. Uh, and there isn't a whole lot. So it's like, we, you know, we have a, we have it there. That, that's an issue. And, and so in doing this process, it was like, okay, well, you know, the need is we need to educate more people on, um, on, on, on regenerative farming. And then what, throughout that, you know, we can't just educate them on it because consumers need to know, Hey, where am I spending my dollars? Um, and understanding that I'm voting for these things that i say that I don't stand for by going and shopping at these, institutions or these organizations. So um, it's kind of hard to say. And, you know, you know, it's kind of hard to say, hey, I'm all for regenerative agriculture and I support this. And then, you know, and then you eat at, you know, certain establishments. It's like, well, you do understand that nothing about that is regenerative whatsoever. Um, So I I like to ask people, 
do you know where your your last meal was raised or where it was made? So, and there's a difference. Um, we don't we don't make anything. Uh, we we don't we don't. Only thing we make is value added products: bacon, sausage. Those things that have to be made out of a product. We don't make beef. We don't make chicken. We don't do any of things. We, we raise them. Like we raise them. Uh, we graze them. Um, so yeah, with the farmers concord, Paige and I was you know Paige was like, hey, you know, I think this is a way for us to um, one educate the community on regenerative agriculture. And then, you know, in doing so, we would bring in, you know, maybe teach or give others the opportunity. One, we're going to paint a picture. We're just going to show people that regenerative farming and farmers can be educated or they are educated. Um, They are business minded. They do run successful businesses. They are black. They are Asian. They are Mexican. Um, they are 19, 18 years old and they are 70 years old, uh, with no experience. Um, you know, just kind of painting, not, not painting a picture, just showing that it does exist. And if, even if it doesn't exist, it can't happen. We we're doing it. Um, we're, we're doing it. So with the farmer's concord, the farmer's concord, which is still in the works, um, I think so. We were saying that we we had a date where we were just gonna make everything super official, but the Farmers Concord is already happening, and I say it's already happening because we've been able to partner with other organization or other organizations like Hair for USA, um, which are like I mean catalysts for um, educating and teaching and um, educating consumers and individuals on regenerative agriculture. Uh, and pasture and just what it looks like, what right looks like on a on a grand scale. Uh, I say on a commercial scale, just because they uh, at, at the level that they're producing, it's it would be considered commercial. Um, but they're still they're very much and based as a regenerative farm. So the Farmers Concord, we're working with other farmers, uh, we're working with other community leaders that contribute to agriculture. Most of them, you know, didn't know that they were. So we do this thing like the farmer's table and the farmer's table allows us to bring in um, producers from the community. So our last dinner, um, which is something that we're going to transition is what is what we're using to create the farmer's concord, drive um, attention to it or just build on it is the farmer's table is an opportunity for a consumer to sit down at the table with the producers. Uh, So our last dinner. Uh, we had a local produce farm, um, which is, I mean, it's a regenerative farm. Uh, we have a flower farm. We have a flower farm, a um, a local chef, and who else was? There? And then um, a couple other producers, just produce farms. So all of these um, vendors are, you know, we're a part of making this dinner happen. And, and what the um, what the guests didn't know was that all of them were going to be at the dinner. So as we're all sitting down at this farm table, um, we're sitting down and people are like conversating. We're, you know, we're doing our, you know, Paige and I are telling people, OK, this is what this is about. And, you know, just kind of do what we do at these um, at our farmer's tables dinner um, at dinners. The uh, people start asking questions and they were like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you you're the farm like you raise. And they're like, yeah, we're the, we're the, some of them I didn't even know. And, um, and, and Paige was like, you know, that's the, and I was like, I had, you know, I, I didn't even get a chance to meet them before we, you know, before we sat down, Paige has been to their farm multiple times and, uh, and we're sitting out and we're having these conversations. And there was a, at one point the night we got to the point where you have four, four farms from the, from within a, maybe a 10 mile radius, having a conversation with, consumer eaters, consumers that are from Charlotte, um, uh, South Carolina, you know, Durham, Raleigh, they're all in, you know, no reason to be no, I mean, no particular reason to be sitting at a table other than to, other than to share, you know, in, in a great meal. Did they know that they were going to be having conversation with an education, being educated by uh, the people who produce their meal? So I was just like this this is this is amazing. And this is exactly what the Farmers Concord is about, is about bringing the community to the table with the producers. Um, yeah. So 
Yeah. And it's um, it's still something I think we're this upcoming year, we're going to start being a little bit more aggressive with it. So bringing in some uh, starting an intern program where we'll bring in a few interns um, that are paid every time people hear like intern or apprenticeships, like people are always like, oh, you got to you got to pay people. And it's like, well, yeah, we do. Like we're like we, we want people to um, be motivated um, to stay. And, and that's one of the things that you kind of don't see a whole lot of. We want people to come and want them to farm, but we don't want to pay them well. And that's with a lot of producers and the farmers concord is, you know, that's one of the things that, Hey, we have to educate farmers as well, you know, on what a fair wage looks like, like what your value is. Like we have to, people have to be reminded a good thing that I wasn't, I didn't come from farming um, is I knew how to assess value. I knew what value I brought and uh, I know what my time is worth. And, uh, and a lot of time farmers, you know, they don't feel very valued and, you know, it's just kind of, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing everything. Their families are sacrificing everything to provide this product for, um, individuals that, you know, that they feel don't appreciate them. Um, and they don't appreciate them because they, you know, because of the way that they spend their dollars, but farmers also have to be educated enough to say, Hey, this is what I have to, I have to demand from my consumers. You know, this is how much this costs. This is a true cost. And, um, and so, yeah. Um, so we're going to bring in some interns and, uh, we're working with, uh, we're going to be, um, partnering with two other farms, produce farms in order to, re- to complete the cycle. I mean, to complete the, to, to make the, the ultimate picture of a regenerative farm. So we're going to have produce and livestock. Um, and, and I, I've, I've, Heifer International is doing it. I mean, Heifer USA is doing it, but I don't know any other like smaller farms that are like, I know a few that are doing it. Um, but we have to get, you know, they're, you know, again, like they're in their shells. No, don't nobody know about it, but we need, we need more of those because I mean, that's, that's what a true farm is like produce and livestock. It can all work. It all does work together. So uh, Farmers Concord, we're going to be kicking that off next year where you'll start seeing stuff about it. And um, we'll start hosting a few events, uh, training events, uh, workshops to teach people on uh, to teach consumers how, you know, what, what a chicken is, where it comes from, you know, how to process or how to harvest a whole bird, uh, you know, buy the whole bird out of the store, take it home and cut it up and make, you know, four meals opposed to buying some chicken breast and you got to go back to the grocery store in two days. So, uh, so yeah, that's the farmer's gun for it. Love it. Love it. Look forward to seeing that develop and getting that out there to the, to the, the to the world. Uh, where would you recommend folks go to just learn more about like the, where they can purchase your products, whether they're based domestic or locally within the, the Durham area or elsewhere across the, the country? Yeah. So, um, you can, we have a, we sell via, um, well, we have an e-commerce site, um, which is www.grassgraze.com. And on there, you can currently, you can purchase um, and we can ship. We um, we say nationwide. UPS has been real, or, or carriers have been, um, carriers have been experiencing a lot of uh, delays. And uh, we're, we're actually on the fence about if we're gonna continue to, we may just suspend it for a little bit. Um, just the and maybe focus on the east coast um but we'll still sell like we'll we'll start you'll start seeing our hoodies and t-shirts and stuff about um just you know we're going to be a little bit more creative with our swag is what it's called um um to just kind of to to stir up the conversation as to you know who's your farmer like a lot of people always like why do people who is your farmer if you don't have one you should, you should find one like you really need to you need a farmer and you, you you'll be surprised at where you are even in a metropolitan area you can have a farmer and live in a city so um but yeah you can purchase products on our on our website and locally you can you can purchase products on farm everything is run through our website so um if you go in there and you can't figure out how to do like an on-farm pickup or whatever you can just hit the chat button and it goes to one of our phones, um, someone will respond. Um, and if um, if you're interested in farm tours and stuff like that, we're gonna kick those back off um, n- next spring. Um, 
we're not going to do like fall. We were considering doing some fall stuff this year, but with just kind of the, the way that things are going, we're not really sure if it's, uh, um, we have a lot of projects coming up and we kind of want to, with the whole transitioning from our farm to merge, not merging, but partner with another farm, like we want to make sure that we're creating a uh, safe environment for um, our community. So follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we're very, very active on there. Um, we do a lot of teaching and coaching and stuff on there. Like that's, we're using the platforms, you know, and every, if you wonder why we post so much, hey, it's people ask how you prepare a steak every time I sell something at the farmer's market. And, you know, it just made sense to just make a video about it and put it on social media. So you'll be surprised with um, what you can learn how to cook on there. So, uh, so yeah, that's a way of following us. And yeah, the, currently that's it. We are not at any farmers markets. We sell at a local CSA in Raleigh as well. Uh, all of that you can find on our website at www.grassgraze.com. Awesome. Well, we'll link all that up in the show notes and and uh, stay up to date on on all that you're doing. All right, Derek, this has been awesome to be able to hang with you today. I'm grateful for what you and Paige are building. I, I'm proud to be a Grass Gaze customer, and I wish you all continued good work. Yep. Thank you. All right. He's Derek Jackson, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we're out of here. Mm-hmm.